Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block Politics, Perspectives, and Players. At the end of the month, Ukrainians will go to the polls, with over 850 observers from 13 countries monitoring the election process against Russian interference. The international community is watching these elections and what actions Russia will take to influence the outcome. Canada has sent 58 election monitors to Ukraine, and earlier this week, the government of Canada announced it was extending its military training mission to that country for another three years. Joining me now is E.R. Michael Chishin, CEO and Executive Director of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Welcome to the show, E.R. Thanks for the invitation to be here. We're going to get to the Ukrainian elections in just a moment, but first I want to start here in Canada because the government announced an extension of their mission in Ukraine, the military mission there in particular, until the end of March of 2022. That's right. What has Canada been achieving in Ukraine and your thoughts on the extension of the mission? So we're very pleased. Uh, I think that all Canadians can be really proud of the work that Operation Unified fire is doing in Ukraine. We've been there for many years. This is the second renewal of the mission. Uh, there's seven countries actually that are part of the mission and they're doing the training uh, work that Ukrainian military needs to meet NATO standards. So everything from first aid basics to military police, chaplaincy, uh, really fundamental uh, structural reform and uh, modernization of Ukraine's armed forces. And we know that their, their impact is making a difference. I've heard from Ukrainian and Canadian soldiers who've been on the ground that uh, the training that they provide saves lives. I know that Canada had been sending some military equipment to Ukraine and there was discussion over should it be lethal, non-lethal. I believe it was all non-lethal. That's right. Is, is that something that the Ukrainians would still like to see, something beyond that non-lethal capacity for Canada to supply arms? Absolutely. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian side and, and our community here in Canada believes that the next step for Canada's growing security and defense relationship is to send more of the lethal arms. There is a live uh, hot war going on in Ukraine for about five years now and uh, the Ukrainian side is suffering uh, casualties. I think up uh, from January to now about 82 uh, soldiers have been killed. So Ukraine does need that kind of military support. Uh, but th this training mission and all the other supports that Canada provides in terms of the non-lethal assistance are essential to, to them holding their ground against the Russian aggression. Do you have a sense that that's something the Canadian government would be willing to consider to, to actually send arms? Uh, I think that as Ukraine and Canada build a stronger defense relationship, there's growing comfort about uh, the way that the Ukrainian armed forces operate and the, the, the responsibility that they take for uh, the weapons in their hands. And we know, for example, the American uh, armed forces have uh, allowed uh, Javelin missiles uh, to go to the Ukrainian armed forces and are training them on it. So we think that's a good first step and we're looking forward to uh, growing that relationship between Canada and Ukraine. I think a lot of our viewers will remember the ship's crew, the Ukrainian yes. ship's crew that was taken hostage by mm -hmm. the Russians. They're still in custody. Do we have any update on how they're doing or on when they might be released? So there's 24 uh, young men, very young men, that are uh, in custody. They're, they've been moved to Moscow. Uh, they are treating themselves as prisoners of war. Uh, Russia is trying to try them in their domestic system for acts of terrorism. Uh, they've been subjected to all sorts of psychological testing and um, uh, we would feel unjust uh, court proceedings. Uh, their families are coming to Moscow to try to see them. Their families have been profiled in Canadian media. It's a really terrible situation because they have no certainty about what, what they're being charged with, why they're even being held. And even the UN last week recognized these people are being held illegally as, as, war, as prisoners of war. Sorry. And uh, they're part of the, the growing list of, of Ukrainian citizens that Russia has captive. There's, there's over 70 Crimean Tatars, Ukrainian citizens in Crimea, who are also political prisoners held by Russia. And uh, they're all languishing in Russian jails without a uh, fair process. Back in 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea. Part yeah, of Ukraine. illegal invasion, yes. I know, obviously, that's, that's been a lot of what this hot war has been about. Do you think there's more that can be done by Western allies or by Ukraine to try to get that territory back? And do you think it's realistic that that's going to happen? Sure, so we, we it's actually five years last week that the illegal uh, invasion took place with the, the fake referendum that uh, Putin has trumpeted as the reason that he's allowed to uh, have Crimea as part of the Russian Federation. We think that the sanctions that Canada put on, uh, on Russian officials, on him, on uh, companies that are involved in Crimea, are, it's, uh, that's the, the way that uh, Canada and our NATO allies, EU, US, you know, together can continue to put pressure on, on the Russian Federation. Those sanctions make a big impact economically. 
the uh, remove Russia as a as a place where foreign investors want to go, and they're eating into their uh, expenditures in terms of their military. So we think that continued uh, targeted sanctions that focus on the rights of these prisoners, the 94 right now, and I'm sure there will be others given the severe human rights repressions that we see happening in Crimea. Ukrainians head to the polls at the end of this month and there's been a lot of stories about alleged Russian interference, about propaganda, about fake news. Right. How concerned are you about the integrity of this election? So I think it's clear that there's one country, uh, one uh, regime that doesn't want Ukraine to have a, a sustainable democracy and that's the Russian regime. Uh, I think that Canada, Canada and our allies have been doing a lot since Ukrainian independence, but especially this year with elections observations, with building democratic systems and making all the, the right choices to help Ukrainians make their country democratic and Western and open. So we, we see those stories that you're seeing about cyber attacks on disinformation and fake news. Uh, it is unfortunately a warning for Canadians about what may happen in our election and that's why we're, we're again happy that the Canadian government has an observations mission there and is spending some money and some time to, to observe and learn the lessons of what's happening there because Ukraine is very much the laboratory and the front line for uh, what Russia is testing in terms of hybrid warfare both on the information and military front. What's your biggest concern when it comes to that upcoming election and Russia? So the election is in less than 10 days. We want uh, Ukrainian citizens to have uh, confidence in a free and fair vote that's transparent. Uh, that means that the systems, both paper and electronic, and uh, the, the counting systems, and then the, the eventual runoff will be open and transparent and, uh, and have the approval of, of Western observers in terms of the, the process. So we're very confident that Canada has done uh, a good job and with our, our European allies and the American allies to support that system, but we are uh, in no ways uh, underestimating what the Russian regime may plan to do in terms of launching cyber warfare, increased disinformation on a scale that we have not yet seen. There are an incredible number of candidates in this election who are all running. Uh, they're all hoping to win 39, as I look down here at our notes. 39 candidates. Do you think that having that number and all of them running at less than 30% that they would need to win increases the opportunities for Russian meddling? I think that Russian meddling will happen whatever number of candidates there are in Ukraine and in other countries, uh, even in the United States. And I think that uh, Ukraine has a, a very thriving democracy, and I think we as Canadians can be proud of the fact that we've been there since their independence to support that. So uh, democracy will play itself out. You know, there's, there's that many candidates, there's a number of, of front runners and a number that are, are not as much front runners. And so, uh, you know, I think we will, we will let the Ukrainian people decide and, and support their ability to have a free and fair election, which unlike the Russian regime and many of the other countries in their neighborhood, you know, they don't support free and fair elections. And so I think we can see the, the, the thriving democracy as, a, as an asset and as a sign that we're doing the right thing to support Ukraine. But given that there's likely to be a second round because of mm -hmm. that, do you think that gives the Russians, I, obviously democracy has to play out, but it gives them an opportunity to, to raise a question about the legitimacy and say, oh, wow, look, it had to go to a first round. There wasn't a clear majority. Is that something you think they're going to try to exploit? Uh, second round elections are, are normal in Ukraine and in much of uh, Europe in terms of the system. So I don't think there's anything unusual there. I think it gives them more time. I think it gives them more time to adapt to whether it's online or in person or disinformation kind of campaigns. So that unfortunately, uh, it opens the window of opportunity for those kind of attacks, but I don't think that the second round itself is unusual. What more would you like to see the Canadian government doing? As you mentioned, we think that uh, Canada's growing support for Ukraine and the security and defense field is essential. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in uh, technology-driven uh, military equipment that, that uh, Ukraine could benefit from. Uh, we know that the sanctions that Canada puts on along with our allies are essential sort of as safeguards for uh, establishing the international rules-based order on punishing human rights abusers, but we know there's a lot more that can be done. Those 24 sailors that are languishing in prisons, those 70 Crimean Tatars that are languishing in prisons, they need to know that Canadians stand with them based on the human rights abuses that are being reported internationally.